Okay, so Sunipta, I think we should start. Yeah, please. Yeah, please yeah. So, um, Vishwanath, thank you. Thank you for supporting this uh, initiative that we've started at Poche and particularly this, uh, uh, the talk uh, as part of Poche, the Poche Conversations. Uh, I'm uh, particularly excited because uh, a few years ago, I uh, happened to uh, uh, attend a, 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 a talk at the School of Planning. Uh, now as architecture students and faculty, we tend to think that the planning talks are these uh, dry statistical policy matters, uh, uh, you know, uh, and uh, nothing could have prepared me for your talk. Uh, and I remember it kind of uh, spanning this canvas of microbial details about uh, why shit smells and other such wonderful things and uh, right to urban policy level, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, thought and uh, engagement. And what really uh, I, I remember most from that is uh, the way that you engage with uh, communities and, and people. Uh, and uh, since then, we have had occasion to meet a few times and chat over the phone. Uh, I also remember that when we uh, showed you what we were doing on the step wells, you were most uh, intrigued by a carving of a fish. Uh, that was there in the step well. And I remember the conversation which talked about this uh, relationship with the larger ecology of all plant and animal life and all of it tied together. Uh, and uh, following uh, your work with uh, Biome uh, Environmental Solutions and the Biome Trust, one is uh, uh, and reading uh, and watching videos as come comes online from time to time, one is uh, really taken by the, the kind of spread and uh, the kind of uh, uh, breadth of engagement from policy to communities to, you know, uh, developing a, a rainwater filter. Uh, so, I mean, it's uh, wonderful to see all this and uh, thank you again for uh, agreeing to speak here. And I'm uh, sure that uh, this talk will be as uh, enthralling as the last one I was in. Thank you, Vishwanath. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for those kind words. And uh, I'm sort of hugely intimidated, A, by the audience itself because of the young participants and the ideas they've been developing and sharing, as well as the star cast of speakers you had uh, and you are going to have. So uh, it's quite a task. So what I'll try to do is to sneak in my own perspective into this whole idea through uh, narratives and stories on water, but we'll also talk about time and space in general, right? So... Uh, let me share some of these photographs and experiences with you. Yeah. Uh, always good to begin with a profound quote or a not so profound quote. And so everybody can sort of internalize it and uh, uh, make whatever sense you want to with the uh, Santayana saying those who do not learn from history are condemned to repeat it. Yeah. So I'll start very quickly because water in India is uh, such a vast subject as uh, one grapples with the idea itself and the physical scale, if you're only to talk about, then you're talking gigaliters of water and so on and so forth. So it's good to start to talk with, uh, um, with something very specific, eh? very typical. And this is my uh, favorite hero for the moment. And it's his reimagination of water or what you would call waste water. And so I start with the story of Muniraj. Here's a small town, 50,000 population called Vijaypura, about 40 kilometers from Bangalore. The small town succeeded in having a sewage network for half of the town or three-fourths of the town, but could not set up a sewage treatment plant because of various reasons. Ran out of money, no land. And so the raw sewage was flowing out in the wastewater drain outside the town and entering the lake close by, which was their source of drinking water. So what do you do? I mean, in the conventional paradigm, the idea is to set up an STP to treat the water of, in the sewage treatment plant to require standards, legal standards, and then leave it in the environment. So that's the conventional response. The fact is that the municipality does not have money, the, there's no land. And so what do you do with the, the reality of wastewater flows? So Muniraju, what he did was to tap in into this wastewater stream. Mind you, this is untreated wastewater into a small pond because his the farm is absolutely next to the drain. And from there, with this untreated wastewater, he pumps it in onto his land. And remember, there's a backstory to this, which I forgot to tell you, is that Muniraju has six hectares of land. He had one bore well to supply all waters to the land. The bore well had gone to a thousand foot depth. 
and the bore well ran dry one day. The day the bore well ran dry, Muniraju became from a landed farmer to somebody who was a laborer in other people's fields because there was no water in his field. And so in that background, Muniraju sees this wastewater and picks it up and starts to cultivate. And this is Muniraju, this is, uh, and his family working at the back. So farmers as a solution to wastewater problems is one frame that I'm trying to put before you. Muniraju and, uh, and family work on the field and they did two things, two remarkable things for wastewater flows, which has me thinking about it and has me giving an opportunity at the policy, policy space uh, for this in a wastewater policy. That is to say farmers have solutions for wastewater problems of India. So he grows mulberries. Now, Shahdood, mulberry mm -hmm. is a plant which is not edible. This is not the edible variety. It's only to be fed to silkworms, right? So what he has done is he's de-risked consumers in the urban space who would have otherwise have eaten food or, or crops or vegetables, which this wastewater would have grown. The second thing which he did to de-risk people was he made furrow irrigation and now it's progressed to drip irrigation. This is not flood irrigation, what you see is furrow irrigation. So the farm workers, what people who work on the land do not have to get in contact with the wastewater, right? So the two major risk category groups were de-risked through his practical application. And he converted the six hectares completely to a green patch, 365 days a year, 366 every leap year, wastewater flows and his land is green and productive. Now this mulberry leaves has a premium in the market. People come and pay a price before the leaves are big enough. The leaves grow quicker and faster. And then they take it and feed it to the silkworm. Now the silkworm plays two roles. One, it's providing uh, a livelihood to the silkworm rarers. Two, it's verifying the quality of the leaf. If there's any heavy metal or any contaminant in the leaf, the silkworm is a very sensitive worm. It will die. It will not grow. So the silkworm on a daily basis verifies the quality of Muniraju's cultivation and farming practice and the mulberry leaf. And this is how the mulberry leaves are fed to the silkworms. The next step is that the silkworms spin cocoons and the cocoons are also very sensitive. So that's the second level of verification of the quality of wastewater use and the mulberry leaf, right? So these cocoons then become yarns. So that's a third level of verification. Because again, if there's something, a problem with the cocoon, the yarns cannot be spun. And finally, it becomes silk saris, the famous Mysore silk saris. What has happened is my, uh, Muni Raju has taken the shit from the households of Vijaypura and converted it to a silk sari without the need of any sewage treatment plant without the need of any technology or any financial outlay. And the challenge before us in terms of reimagining wastewater is, should Muniraju pay Vijaypura, the town, for the wastewater that is received, or should the town pay Muniraju for the treatment it is doing for its wastewater? Now, this is a nice conundrum or a paradigm to arrive at. And what you find is that about 40 hectares of land is good enough to treat the wastewater from a 50 thousand population and completely transform the livelihoods and assets of the farmers as well as of many people there and find a solution to wastewater. Now, two problems may arise. People from a conventional paradigm say, what about groundwater pollution? What Muniraju does with this 2,000 to 3,000 years of experience as farming generations is he makes sure that the wastewater does not go below one feet. That is the root zone of the mulberry plant, right? So there's no groundwater contamination. And there is no soil contamination because all this wastewater, and remember, this is not industrial wastewater, but domestic water. Everything is taken up by the mulberries and converted to silk, right? So the point one makes is that if one is stuck in a framework of solutions, which is conventional, one may not even have the eyes to see solutions being provided by people and therefore not incorporate it into the framework of uh, managing India's environment, because otherwise this wastewater would end up in a lake and pollute the lake and then pro pro pollute the drinking water, which is a problem in, uh, in uh, Delhi particularly, right? Now, remember, there are close to 8,000 gram panchayats and small towns in India, urban centers and almost urban centers, which have the same problem. And we're not going to get any sewage treatment plants to them in the near future. So can we imagine partnerships between agriculture and the city to sort of one aspect of the city's problem creation, which is wastewater, is one idea that one puts. So this is the framework of water where I start with this story. 
because this is India and it's 4,000 billion cubic meters of rain falling in the monsoon months from June to September, four months. And we have to hold on to the water for the rest of the 12 months of the year. And the sun is our biggest enemy, so to say, because the sun evaporates water. And we want to hold on to water in the soil. We want to hold on to water in our sun tanks, in our lakes. The sun, which is otherwise all powerful, all pervading solar energy and all that, when it comes to water is our enemy, is our enemy in, in a sense. And we fight to retain the water from the sun. This is the veins and arteries of India, beautiful photograph which are taken from the web and got it from Grasshopper Company. Now in a dire strait. And then the story is not with the rivers alone, or the story is not Munirajus alone, because the story spans the creation, the very creation of Earth and Pangaea. And when Pangaea and the continental drift starts, and India starts to move in into the Himalayan subplate, the Chinese subplate, the Asian plate, and then create the Himalayas and uh, then the Shivalik. So that's where the story all begins with even Delhi and the Indo Gangetic Plain, as I'll tell you. There's an interesting vignette here also for us in Bangalore, because when India drifts away from Madagascar, in the continental plate. It leaves a portion of the Western Ghats in Madagascar, this island next to Africa. That portion is called the Palghat Gap of the Sahyadri, of the Western Ghats. That remnant of a hundred million year old activity means that during the summer months of April and May, the continent of India heats up and the wet, humid air from the Arabian Sea drifts in through this Palghat Gap, comes up to Bangalore, which is high on the plateau, and it rains in April and May. We get our May showers. We get about 120 millimeters or 140 millimeters of rain in May. The rest of India is sweltering under the loo and heat. But here's a phenomenon which is geological in time, which helps us get water. And that's what we owe our rainwater harvesting and the city's prosperity to an incident which took place 100 million years back. And what happens to the rest of India? Let's remember the sinking of the lower Shivalik plate. Now, as the Shivaliks and the Himalayas start to rise because the Indian plateau is moving into Asia, there's a plate movement also where the, in the Indo-Gangetic plane, the plate starts to lower down. It's lowered down over millions of years. Then the detritus, the silt and clay, driven by the rivers and tributaries and the rainfall, come and have settled into the Indo-Gangetic plane, making it one of the most fertile areas in the world. So what we're talking about from the Indus Valley, uh, the Indus River in Pakistan, now, now Pakistan, all the way to Bangladesh, is the Indo-Gangetic plane. And this is absolutely the most fertile. And I'll come to that as we go along because there's also another sub story hidden here. There's the Saraswati River, which we remember in our Rig Veda and our uh, oral histories and oral memories. And the Saraswati on the banks of which the Indus Valley civilization or the Harappan civilization or the Indo Saraswati civilization establishes itself, disappears, perhaps in the living memory of our people. And so the question is, why did the Saraswati disappear? And if you read up, there is a lot of debate. Valdia versus uh, Geosan, Libyu Geosan is a stuff of legends in science because Geosan has this particular archaeological theory. And as in science, it's contested and Valdia contests it and they battle it out in current science and other magazines. Fabulous to read and understand from. But why did the Saraswati disappear? Perhaps the Saraswati disappeared because the Yamuna was captured by the Ganga and the Satlaj was captured by the Sindhu, right? So river capture was one perhaps reason. The other was climate change, natural climate change, a monsoon coming in and going out. Tectonic activity, it's a very tectonically rich plate, the Himalayas and the, there are earthquakes there, or a combination of all. But what we know is that a civilization, which was an urban civilization, disappeared in the living memory of our people. And people then had to move out and become rural again, and then urban again. Fascinating also, because when you look at uh, the arable land, the land which is productive and is fit for agriculture. The USA and China are the largest land masses, right? 9.8 km, million square kilometers and 9.6 square kilometers. India is about one third of them. But in terms of arable land, agricultural productive land, India is equivalent to the USA and China, not more than China, right? So here's this gorgeous land of ours, which is really agriculturally productive, all because of geological factors. And the monsoon drives this agricultural productivity. A lot of people would argue that agriculture was the beginning of the destruction of the ecology and environment. If we, set, if we keep that in mind, but then look at what it means in terms of human population and fecundity, 
this is the densest populated region in the whole globe, the Indo-Gangetic Plain. The most arable, the most fertile, and the naturally so the most fecund also in terms of population. Right? So that's what we are all about in terms of water. And Wittfogel, this uh, American philosopher, in 1957 uh, wrote a book called Oriental Despotism. It's been challenged uh, in terms of its theory, but here's what he said, that all civilizations develop around the control of water. Before that, they are tribal civilizations. There's no sense of a central government. And it's water and its control in terms of canals, dams, and irrigation that brings society together. And it then demands a ruler who can, who can sort of direct and manage all this labor, as so it's called, for water. And therefore, all civilizations are basically hydraulic civilizations. There's a corollary to that. And the argument is that when there is surplus in agriculture, the urbanization begins because then you have the capacity to trade and then barter and all that begins. So civilizations begin around surplus agriculture. And it would be natural to assume that in the indo gangetic plain, which is so fertile, that uh, agriculture would be in surplus and therefore civilizations would start naturally in the Indus Valley or in the indo gangetic plain. So these are things that we need to remember because these are also societal constructs. And this leads us to what's happening with water in India. We have one of the largest canal irrigation systems in the world. Though canal irrigation started pre-British, but the real spread of canal irrigation in India starts with the British coming in. And one of the first colleges to be established in India to train engineers is the college at Roorkee, and it's been designed to train canal building, canal construction. And so the engineers in India, since the 1840s have been driven by this notion of control of nature, control of water to build canals and dams. And that's a historic legacy in almost 200 years old. So we have to remember why we are what we are. And Sir Arthur Cotton is another British engineer. He imagined the canal network in India to be a replacement for railways, right? He, he almost won. It was just a twist of destiny, a twist of fate that resulted in the railway network coming in India, not a canal network, if other cotton had his base. And imagine what India would have been if it was linked by canals, not railways. So something to imagine. And other cotton has a temple to himself and a statue in the Godavari Delta where people pay, pray to him for the barrages and the dams he built. Right? So this is what water is all about. So we may in an ecological uh, space critique the dams and canals, but in the lived life, a lot of peasantry and farmers these people were gods. They are, are continue to be gods. And by twists of fate, we have also other things. In the 40s, uh, after the Second World War, there was only one economic superpower left, the United States of America. And its model of development was showcased as the Tennessee Valley Authority. And a lot of engineers from India were taken and shown the Tennessee Valley Authority. And that was seen as progress and development. So there, they came back to India and started building the Damodar Valley corporation in the model of the Tennessee Valley Authority. And so we went from 500 dams in independence to 5,500 dams and counting more. Again, the notion of development in the USA was sort of imprinted on India in terms of water management and uh, dam construction. And that's why we are where we are. So we have to remember this as we go along, as, because history tells us a lot. Watershed, soil and water conservation measures, you know, India has the largest extent of land under soil and water conservation measures. And it starts from places like Sukhomajri, upstream of Sukhna Lake, Gabbal Nala, Mitte Mari. These are legendary in watershed terms. So we also started focusing on soil and water conservation long back in the 60s and 70s, and we've expanded the area a lot. But if we ask ourselves, why are our rivers dry and why is the Yamuna in the condition which it is, there are some answers to us. The population growth is, of course, one answer. There's an increased demand from the growth of population, though it may not be as high as the industrial demand and the food grain production. And we made choices. Uh, we made choices in the 60s. In the 60s, mid 60s, we went to war with Pakistan. We were supporting Vietnam and its struggle against the USA. We were living ship to mouth. There were three years of drought and famine in India. And PL480 food grains were coming in and we needed to find a solution to this drought famine condition and food insecurity. So we went, T. Subramaniam, others, M.S. Swaminathan, they go to Mexico, meet up with Norman Borlaug and the high yielding variety of wheat comes to India, right? Only 18,000 tons of it. And then we start growing high yielding variety of wheat and then rice, and then followed by cotton and sugar cane. And these four crops then start to consume huge amounts of water. Remember the high yielding variety of wheat and rice consume three times to four times more water and require more pesticides and fertilizers for their growth to be accentuated. Right? And in electricity, we have 
a huge increase in generation, something like 330 times in installed capacity. And electricity is coming from thermal power plants, which consume a lot of water, not only destroy coal bearing areas, but also consume a lot of water and hydroelectric plants, which dam up rivers and destroy the ecological integrity of rivers. And so therefore dam construction works, wheat alone work, wheat. So we become food secure. We have food surplus nation, grain surplus nation at least. And, but then we are now becoming water insecure. So these are all historical incidences which have driven water consumption. So let's come to Delhi. And this is one of my favorite uh, shots of uh, Raghurai, perhaps one of the best Indian photographers India has ever produced. And this is Agrasenki Bawdi in the heart of Delhi, Latians Delhi, right, Connaught Place. And there you see the waters. This is perhaps a photograph of 1982. It's after the Commonwealth Games. And this young lad who's diving in is actually the watchman of that place for some time, right? So there's this story behind it too. And this is what it is now. So we've done a great job of retaining the heritage. And what I point out is that the skeleton has remained, the soul has gone, and we don't miss the soul. So those who go there and take photographs or describe it or uh, you know, measure, draw it or whatever, I mean, I don't see them noticing that the water is gone, right? And then the question to ask ourselves is why did the water go? And in urban India, it went because of many reasons, but two of the more major reasons were unregulated use of groundwater. All those apartments are allowed to draw groundwater unregulated, but two more important, we built roads. And in this case, the Metro below the ground and the Metro station is three stories below the ground and the Metro station pumps out all the aquifer water because it does not want to flood and dries up the aquifer completely. And in our cities, roads and infrastructure do not talk to groundwater and water, and that's been a tragedy for us. So therefore our master plans, our building bylaws, now have to start to recognize these interlinkages and start to draw up a conversation so that we recognize what is it that we need to protect in our cities. Transportation has become the ruling god of urban planning. Work, home, uh, transport relationships should be minimized is the mantra by which we model our cities. We increase densities in corridors, we make sure that people move, but natural resources don't figure in our urban planning as the way they should. And so that's one of the challenges which is depicted by this aggressive Kibauri. And within that, there are vignettes. You know, this is uh, Bangla Sahib, Gurudwara Bangla Sahib in uh, Bangla Sahib in uh, the heart of Delhi again. And this is a very interesting story because cholera and plague have also uh, driven many decisions in India around water, especially urban water supply systems. We had the bacterial uh, and virus uh, definition of disease only in the 1850s, right? Until that time, we were designed, dealing with water as, uh, as not a carrier of disease, but as, uh, as a, something which is precious. Cholera comes to Delhi. People who drink water from the wells and other places fall sick and people die, about 5 lakh people die in Delhi with a very low population base. But those who drink water from the Bangla Sahib Gurudwara's wells do not die of cholera. And there are two reasons for it. One, because it's a vast expanse of land, so the well itself is protected from sanitation uh, contamination. Two, the water is served by sevadars, you know, volunteers who give you the water, so there's no contamination of the water. So those who drink water from the wells survive cholera. And so therefore, mystical powers are allotted uh, uh, to the well. But now the well water is gone. And in the Bangla Sahib itself, you see RO plants filling the water in the sarovar, right? So we've not even been able to recognize the benefits that the wells gave us or groundwater gave us. We haven't run, learned the right lessons. And in the techno-utopian construct we have, we set up RO plants and fill our wells and lakes with reverse osmosis water. Uh, this is a, a sort of a what what we've become and this is what our uh, rivers are like the yamuna is it's a classic photographs of the froth and foam in yamuna and this comes essentially from the way we want to clean our clothes the detergents we use in our washing machine each house which uses a rin bar or a rim bar everybody who uses shampoo on their heads or dishwashers in their kitchen sinks is responsible for it so it's mia kalpa for everybody mostly everybody right and so then froth and foam. so we have We've made villains of ourselves too. So how do we address that is something uh, which design will have to think of. But if there's one point that I want to make to you as a group, is this what differentiates India from the rest of the nations of the world is our complete dependence on groundwater. We have 33 million wells and bore wells, 65% of our total water requirements, agriculture, industrial, urban, rural habitation, everything. 85% of our drinking water needs, 250 cubic kilometers of groundwater extracted annually. This is more than USA and China combined. 
USA and China combined, number two and number three, extract 220 cubic kilometers, we extract 250 cubic kilometers. So, and the major resource recharge is rain, right? So we are a groundwater civilization. We were one, we are now, and we don't recognize it adequately enough, and we do not throw enough knowledge into it for us to be able to understand and manage it. And so therefore, in from every unit of design, I would urge you to start to understand the aquifer and the groundwater conditions where you are, apart from the watershed that you are, the, the biome that you occupy in terms of the plant biodiversity, animal biodiversity, but begin with the geology, begin with the aquifer, and come up and understand where the water is and what is needed to recharge it and to manage it sustainably, then layer a design on it because it's crucial for us, right? And so the liberator, and this is my favorite artifact. This is the first artifact that humans designed to artificially access water. Till then they were dependent on rivers, lakes, you know, ponds or springs, which was natural water sources. But somebody dug a hole in the ground some time back and most probably it was a woman because it's impossible for a man to be creative and doing things. And she dug a hole in sand and she found water. And this was the first human endeavor to access water. And this was totally liberating. Now you were not tied to the tyranny of rivers and lakes. You could go away from rivers and lakes, 48 hours, 72 hours, whatever, you could go occupy the land, dig a hole in the ground, aquifer willing, and you would get water and you would survive. And this act of the well liberated human beings from rivers and lakes, right? So this is something historic which is not recognized enough. But there's another thing about the well. The well talks to you because it tells you summer is coming, right? So you change your behavior based on the ecological resource availability. You start to use less water and you wait for the rains to replenish the well. The well also rewards you. If you make recharge structures, lakes, ponds around, the well gets full and therefore you get more water. If you put all garbage and muck all around, the well punishes you because water gets polluted, you cannot use it. This business of signaling the ecological resource availability is crucial to us to at least begin to manage the resource, right? Now, when you turn on a tap, we don't even know where the water is coming from. We don't know how much water is in the dam and the river, how long it will last, who will get it, right? So this loss of signal is something we need to overcome through design. And one is not saying go back to the well alone, but go back to the signaling and the communication of the resource uh, uh, availability, right? And so this is the point I wanted to make. So we need to go back to the culture of the well. And that's a good culture of the well because we also had a bad culture of the well. There was caste discrimination based on well access water. Water was also discriminatory in nature. Waste was also discriminatory in nature because you had the horrendous practice, you still have it of manual scavenging. So water can unite, but water can also divide and do so in terrible ways, right? So just a reminder to ourselves that Mohenjo-Daro, which is called the Indus Valley Civilization, had one well for every three homes. Uh, Dolavira, dependent on uh, ha harvesting rainwater into cisterns and reusing it, right? Harappa had wells, Lothal, wells and drains, right? So though they were next to rivers, and even Delhi, which is next to the river Yamuna, Yamuna is not the source of the water to Delhi. It's actually the wells of Delhi which are the source of water to, uh, to Delhi in the old days, right? So it was groundwater which provided the water. The river was there for some functions but it was not there for all functions. And it was groundwater which, is, uh, which drove all the old towns and old cities of Delhi. There was some attempt to, make, to bring in canal water to, the, to these forts and to these uh, settlements, but essentially it was groundwater which was driving, uh, driving Delhi. And some of the well water was salty and some of it was sweet, you'll figure that out. And there were aquifers which were used only for drinking and those others which were used for other purposes, right? And so this transcends to 3000 BC, Lothal and and so there are other interesting connects. Sarnath, 260 BC, the Buddha gives his pravachans to seven disciples. Are we, and there's a well there. There's no lake or uh, pond in uh, Sarnath. There are only wells. And this well perhaps dates to 260 BC. The well has water, the water is sweet. Are we connected to the Gautama, the Buddha, not only through his wisdom, but also through the waters that perhaps he drank from this well. And if you talk about sustainable development, you know, what is more sustainable as an artifact which is 2,200 years old and continues to survive, right? So these gives you sometimes goose pimples to think of the connects that we have achieved through water, through time. Ashokanetics, which talk about planting trees, digging wells. This one is near uh, Bhubaneswar, you know, after the Battle of Kalinga, and he says, dig wells for travelers. All temples were built with the well preceding the temple, right? Because you needed water for the workforce and therefore you put it there in, as in Konarak. You'll find it in many places in India. And we mastered the step well construction, Riyaz and, 
and gang, as I would call it, have also already documented the stepwells of Ahmedabad. Chan Bauri, the deepest stepwell. So we gave rise to the aesthetics of water, the social functions of water, as much as to the functional requirements of it, right? And some more, more prosaic. This one is called Bhutoki Bauri. We worked out a legend in which we said that there are gins here so that nobody would go there in the evenings and then those waters were protected for community use. Many stories around it and many, many places. This is near Vidisha. You see these beautiful wells. This one is low lark. It's a typical sort of a Escherian design where it's next to the Ganga, actually. It's very close to the Ganga and it's uh, worship for its fertility rights are, which are around here and this is a step well which provides you water. So we've mastered the craft of it and this is the origin of the river Pinakini. Most of our rivers uh, have a spring as origin and they, they construct a, a structure to, I don't have to talk to you designers and architects, so we've sort of embellished the value of water through our architecture to, in great detail. But how do we find groundwater? <laughs> this is interesting. So. Hydrogeology as a science is still nascent. We're still not able to understand where to drill or dig for a well. I mean, we, we cannot get that granular. We can broadly say what an aquifer looks like, that you will not find water or you'll find water. But to give a point, people in India still depend on this uh, dowser. So you go around with a coconut or a wise stick or a pendulum, walk around barefoot on the land and mark a point and that's where you drill for water. Imagine 33 million bore wells, 250 cubic kilometers of water, and the signs that we have is the signs of a coconut, right? The signs of a bifur. Fascinating. People will verify this chap's uh, point with the hydrogeologist, but will trust him or him in this particular case better than hydrogeologist. That's the way we are. And with the tap, the system is broken because of the disconnect with water as such. And then if science is codified knowledge, codified knowledge, which is replicable, then the art of divining or dowsing is sort of science in a certain fashion because that's codified and spread all across. So what we, people did was to look for landscape marks like termite mounds and a particular tree species, particular plants like the calotropis to identify where the well was dug. Then technology is science in action. And that's what I want to point out that perhaps uh, the Art of science started with the well and with digging for water and technology also developed around the well because water was essential. And so give me a lever long enough, prop strong enough and a place to stand and I'll lift the world. Right? So the first mechanical devices perhaps are around water and the well yeah, or the pulley. Now human beings are essentially lazy. So you want to lift water quickly and easily. So perhaps you put a stick, you had a rope and then you lifted it and that the rope the, the stick became the pulley, the pulley became the wheel, it went into the bullock cart, and so it was used for agricultural transportation. Then it went into the horse cart, became war. Then it went into the automobile and caused all the traffic jams. So all the traffic jams that we see in our city owe its origin to the fact that we, walk, we are lazy and wanted to draw water and we discovered the pulley, right? Did the pulley precede the wheel? Right? Was this one of the first uh, technological discoveries of human beings. I mean, I would love to have it from my romantic perspective. There's not enough literature on it, right? So we need to figure out whether this is true or not, but fascinating to think about, yeah? And look at this, the first pumps, Aragatta, the Persian wheel. So animals are now getting what you call domesticated, right? So which was the first animal to get domesticated? Was it the dog? Was it the bacteria for curds? Was it bullocks or horses? But anyway, the bullocks are now auroch. The big bull is now caught and made to work for us. And these are the first pumps, the Persian wheel. Somewhere around Sindh, Rajasthan, Pakistan, uh, this area perhaps discovered the Persian wheel and the gears that are needed to move it. We called it the spoke pot and they got the water out, right? Remember, water is still visible. You can only draw from 60 feet. You can only irrigate two acres. The bulls can work, the bullocks can work for six hours in a day. They need to be fed, right? So there's still a limit on the draw of water. Then technology takes us to the era of the bore well. Now groundwater becomes invisible. Here's a, a webcam going in into a bore well, and this is at about 400 to 450 feet. Remember, cracks and fissures, right? Uh, nobody has any idea at all. People believe there are streams there, lakes there, ponds there, but actually in the hard rock terrain of India, in the basalt and granite, it's through small cracks and fissures that water comes in into the bore well. And that's what we draw out. And remember, we're completely borewell dependent, right? So 
till we make this visible to the user, till we start to understand how much water there is, how much, what is the quality of it, we have a problem. But it's all not gloom and doom. Technology seems to have this uh, character of providing solutions in the short term, but the excessive use of it creates a problem in the longer term. So it becomes a bigger problem and then we need, need to figure that out. So with the coming of the borewell, we eliminated the chili worm, we eliminated cholera, we eliminated the plague, and the hard mark to hand pump did it do very well. You know, this was a design which was which came in India, this hand pump. Unfortunately, it's now disappearing because the groundwater tables have fallen below 220 feet. This was the first drilling rig which came to India in the 60s. Brought from UK, uh, Denmark, and USA, 17 of these rigs arrived. UNICEF brought them, hard rock. They could drill through hard rock, about 100 to 200 feet. The young men and women who took this rigs to Bihar and Jharkhand and Chhattisgarh were regarded as heroes and heroines, and they provided drinking water during a time of drought and famine. And it lasted a long time, this, uh, this issues, till we started making the rigs ourselves. Yeah, in Tiruchengod in Tamil Nadu is now the mecca of borewell drilling rigs in the world. We export it to Africa, Latin America, everywhere. Now our rigs can drill to 2,000 feet. The genie is out of the bottle, you know, and therefore we drill. What we brought for to drill for drinking water was unleashed into the agriculture sector. And now agriculture competes with drinking water in the same village for the same groundwater. The private bore wells are deeper than the drinking water wells, and therefore there's drinking water insecurity. That's the nature of the beast, right? So therefore, we have a, a huge crisis where uh, uh, where groundwater has sort of disappeared from many blocks. I, I, I mean, I, 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 this is the picture that shows you the West and the South are particularly hit with the, the depletion of groundwater, and uh, it is creating drinking water insecurity too. And this is one chart which I've taken from Dr. Himanshu Kulkarni from Aquadam, which explains what happens to groundwater. It's the complex one, it's the most complex of charts that I have. But what happens is from when you move from A, when the aquifer is full, when you have full drinking water security, to H, when the aquifer is empty, and it, what water you can draw is only when it rains and it fills up to that time, you have grown an agrarian economy and collapsed it. Your drinking water security has plummeted because your aquifers are dry. Most importantly, there's a word there called base flow about G, right? Base flow is groundwater feeding rivers and streams. If we collapse our groundwater, if we deplete our aquifers, our rivers and streams will stop flowing in peninsular India. Those rivers which are not spring fed or glacier fed will all stop flowing. And unless we retrieve our aquifer level up, our rivers will never flow. Some lessons that we have to keep in mind when we think about rejuvenating our uh, groundwater, right? The importance that we have. And the fragility of culture. This may have provided water for 5,000 years. The moment a borewell or a hand pump comes, this is what we do with our wells. Why is it is something that is perplexing, right? Why do we treat it as a dustbin? But again, if the community gets engaged, the beauty is that you don't need mechanical devices or high skills to clean a well. So this community in Bihar, led by Eklavya Prasad and Ekmai Abhiyan, have cleaned up their well, which they had abandoned. But this gives them arsenic-free water. In the Indo-Gangetic Plain, you have arsenic in groundwater. But open wells don't have arsenic. Deep bore wells have, right? 300 feet and below. So for a long time. Now some open wells are also reporting arsenic. But it's leveraging power into the hands of the community to be able to source their own water and manage it on their own, which the well provides which is its power too. So how do we design to empower communities and people engaged in their own solutions? Even in urban areas, this is Bangalore or classic orchards. When people become aware of the power of groundwater. This community decided to clean up its well, removed 100 truckloads of silt and made sure that it was distributed on the lawns and gardens and then the well came back to life. And there's another fascinating story for me. Who are the people who dug our uh, lakes and wells? This is a community called the Ode or the Manwadders, and we find a lot of them in Bangalore, and we're working with them to find water resilience. These people know how to dig, how to deepen uh, wells, how to clean wells, how to dig tanks and lakes and all that. Can they be brought back in terms of livelihoods, and can we then find water security for our cities? One quest, right? The other livelihoods around it, the Bishti in Delhi, has been written about in the Mint, and other people have done some fabulous work with it. But the water carrier, this was water in leather bags used for construction purpose and for distribution for drinking purpose. And this legendary Bishti, who provided water to both sides of a battle, both sides of the enemy. And he's, when Guru Govind Singh called him and asked him, why do you do that? He says, I see the face of the Guru in people. I don't see 
enemies and friends there, right? So this water, this business is, is, is something all transcending. And this Manuwadar and Road community ducked the tank system of South India, you know, catchment, which is a rock catchment, and the tank, which is an artificial lake, which holds water, uh, like this gorgeous um, uh, tank uh, around the Nandi Hills. And then the tank uh, water was used for irrigation to grow rice paddy, you know, these channels, by another community, which was called, which was specialized in agricultural and paddy cultivation, right? So they made the channels and the water distribution was in the hands of a third community called the Niruganti, who ensured that every drop of water was equitably distributed. All communities which are fast disappearing now. And so the gorgeous nature of uh, arid India, where you hold on to water, but you make sure that you send it into the aquifer because you don't want the sun to evaporate it, right? And then the wells fill up. The wells do another thing. What they do is to filter the water and make it drinkable. So nobody took water from the lake itself directly. People would take drinking water from the well. Yeah. And in the landscape, the well aquifer, which is reflecting what, what it should be. So let's come back now to urban area and to a small site. What we do now in terms of design to take ideas and to put it on the ground is to understand the hydrological cycle at the unit of a site. Now, the site could be as small as 150 square meter or 100 square meter. Or it could be a large one, it could be 50 hectares or 100 hectares. It could be the city itself. But draw up a water balance. Now in Bangalore, when I draw up a water balance, before building, the surface runoff is 15%. Recharge is less than 10%. It's actually 3 to 8%. Soil moisture, and this is a fascinating fact all over India. Soil holds more water than aquifers, lakes, rivers, and streams. Soil, the first one meter of soil holds on to 75% of rainwater, and then it's evaporated or evapotranspired by plants, bushes, shrubs, and trees, right? After building, the surface runoff is 90% or even 100%. There's no recharge, there's no evapotranspiration. In smaller plots, right? In larger plots, it could be there. Now you increase surface runoff from 15 to 90% by a factor of six or seven. Therefore, when you see images of flooding in Gurgaon, flooding in uh, Delhi, and flooding in our cities, part of the cause is the increased runoff, Part of the cause is that we have encroached onto floodplains and wetlands, right? But everybody is again culpable to some extent for the urban flooding. So therefore, when we drop a rainwater harvesting policy for Bangalore and the law for Bangalore, we said that we would do it on the basis of biomimicry and make sure that it is mandated that you are responsible for the excess runoff you're sending from your site. That's a policy design. And so therefore, looking at the rainfall pattern on a daily basis, you create something which says that for every square meter of roof area, you must create 60 liters of storage or recharge. And for every square meter of paved area, you should create 30 liters of storage recharge. If you leave areas unpaved, you don't have to do anything because the water will seep in into the soil. And a minimum depth of three meters to get below the clay layer, make sure that it gets into the aquifers. So based on design criteria, understanding of rainfall, understanding of hydrology at a site, you can arrive at city level policy and bylaws, which will guide you to design better. So this is something that you need to work on. So this is what people do. Pick up rooftop rainwater. That blue drum is a filter, sand and charcoal filter. And they send it into the blue tarpaulin thing, which is a well. It gets in. And Mr. Bal Subramaniam here, 85-year-old gentleman, depends on open well water for the whole year from that open well. And we target a million wells for Bangalore City. We say that if we get a million wells and put all the rainwater into it, it will give livelihood security to well diggers who will dig those wells and it will give water security to the city by bringing the aquifer up and it will prevent urban flooding. So these are imaginations of design around water and this is another well which is in a basement which we think we can get to and we got up to about 130,000 wells in Bangalore, right? We've got a target. Then the next level is this, that water cannot be regarded as a private resource alone. Here's a community of 36 acres, 360 plots and they are not connected to the city network. This is again a Bangalore example. What would have happened is that every one of the plots would have dug a borewell. The borewell depths there are 900 to 1,000 feet. It costs about 4 lakh rupees to dig a borewell and to energize it. Let's take a conservative 2 lakh rupees. 316 to 2 lakhs is 7.2 crore rupees. 7.2 crore rupees. 360 straws into the same Coca-Cola bottle. Everybody competing to draw the water out. And pretty soon finished. 7.2 crores, dead asset. How do you turn it around? a dialogue with the community, the banning of private borewells, three community wells, borewells, shared water, metered and tariffed. Even with all the recharge that you do, you cannot exceed consumption beyond a certain limit. And that limit was 20,000 liters per month per family, right? So beyond 20,000 liters, you pay a huge sum of 120 rupees a kiloliter, so on. Metering tariff pricing is crucial to communitizing groundwater, the point I want to make. Then when you do that, 
with the monies collected, invest in a state-of-the-art wastewater treatment plant and supply the treated wastewater to every house free of cost for landscaping, gardening, everything of the adequate quality. So you become a zero runoff for rainwater, zero runoff for wastewater. And then you become actually water positive. You're putting more water into the aquifer than you're taking out. And therefore the lakes in your city can also revive, the groundwater table can revive, and you as a community can be self-sufficient. These are the transformations we need at scale. This is, at, I talked about an individual scale, I talked about a community scale. We need to redesign community scale stormwater so that the stormwaters infiltrate into the aquifers instead of carrying it out, out, out of the site. These are small designs which you see here. Don't forget the maintenance in India. Unfortunately, we don't have a word for preventive maintenance in any of our uh, languages. So therefore, we, the, the idea doesn't exist in our head. So we have to deal with something called preventive maintenance and work on these infrastructure for that. And Belgaum as a city, a Belgaum is a small town in North Karnataka, which is a population of about uh, 10 lakh people, about a million now. They revived something like 70 old open wells, including this well, which uh, Gandhiji had visited. And because of Gandhiji's visit, the well was dug. And because they revived those wells, they're able to provide water to three lakh people from open wells, right? And now they're looking at recharging those open wells and keeping it full all over the time. So it's possible at city scale also to do this. Yeah. And the cost of production, if you look at the economics of it, is 76 paisa per thousand liters. 76 paisa per thousand liters. No? Can you imagine? So it can be really cheap. It's also energy efficient, less carbon emissions as you go along. So then I talk about the next scale, which is a watershed scale. Now here is Bangalore city with three valleys and uh, the top valley is what I talk about called the Hebbal Valley. And within that, I pick one lake, right? This is a lake called Jakur, one of a series of lakes which are interconnected, 50 hectares in water spread. How do you intervene in an urban context to make it viable, right? And so what you do in terms of design, the circular things which you see just below the brown patch, it's a sewage treatment plant. And below that circular thing is a constructed wetland in a patch of land, which is constructed wetland, then the lake comes. And this sequencing is important because the wastewater watershed, you know, that's a watershed and that's a wastewatershed. All the sewage wastewater should come to the sewage treatment plant and be treated there, the secondary levels. The sludge is a fascinating uh, soil stabilizer and manure, and it's the one truckload of it sells for 10,000 rupees. So it, wastewater treatment plants can generate their own revenue energy can be captured and sludge can be captured. Then the treated wastewater comes in into the constructed wetland, where the constructed wetland has a series of plants which can remediate water further, phosphates and heavy metals if there are any, and provide biodiversity space. So wetlands have huge biodiversity, small reptiles, mammals, birds, everything, right? Fishes. And this wetland is doing a fabulous job of cleaning up the water further, and you'll see that this is the cleanliness of wastewater which comes out of the wetland into the lake. Absolutely crystal clear and we've tested it. It's very good. Then the lake fills up and the lake is full of water, which is ready for citizens to enjoy. Yeah. But it also provides livelihoods because the fishermen who cultivates fish in the lake provides proteins to the city and gets about 250 kgs of fish. It's 150 rupees a kg of fish, right? So he earns a livelihood and an income and has a stake in keeping the lake clean from plastics and wetland floating plants, right? And so this fish is what is livelihood driven as water security. And then the birds come, right? The, uh, the pelicans here and the challenges that the pelicans eat four kgs of fish, which is 600 rupees a kg without GST. And therefore, what do you do if there are 250 pelicans in the lake, right? The fisherman now has to face a challenge from the pelicans. But what you find out is that in nature, there's enough fish for the pelicans, painted stocks, and for cormorants and for the fisherman, because nature does not allow, uh, abhors a vacuum and fills it with fish in the lake. And the groundwater in the surrounding areas recharge. This is wastewater turning itself into drinking water in the aquifers, remediated by a switch treatment plant, a wetland and the lake and the earth as a filter. There you have it, about seven and a half to eight million liters of water per day is available as drinking water. Now, imagine this is one lake, if you can redo many lakes in the city, then you have a solution for your wastewater, you have livelihoods, you have bird biodiversity and you have groundwater aquifers. So this is the sort of things that we need to work on. And this is now formally being worked on in the city of Bangalore because water and wastewater uh, is a uh, terrific linkage. Cities are accused of taking away water of rural regional areas, right? Because uh, somehow there's an implicit assumption that the water belongs to agriculture or to ecology and by drawing away water from a, a city is causing problems. But I would argue otherwise. A city is the most efficient user of water. 
the waters that it uses, I mean, compared to one um, hectare of sugarcane, which needs two crore liters of water, uh, an average urban citizen needs about 100 LPCD, 100 liters per capita per day. And that's not consumptive water. Of the 100 that he or she consumes, 80 goes out as wastewater. And if the wastewater is treated and reused for, as you saw, for ecological regeneration, or at this particular case, for agricultural regeneration of the hinterland, then the city is just a pass through for the water flows. And an enricher, it's a fertilizer factory which enriches it with nutrients. Industrial effluents have to be kept out and then it goes on to agriculture. And so what's happening in Bangalore is secondary treated wastewater is being picked up in these 28 wastewater treatment plants. Then it's being pumped up 50 to 70 kilometers to fill the lake ecosystem in a drought prone area being hit with climate change, right? So these lakes are filled with treated wastewater. One lake is filled, it cascades down to six, seven lakes by gravity and then it's purified in the process. And then again, it's pumped up to a higher elevation and then fills it up. 137 lakes are being filled in one district. Overall, about 500 lakes will be filled around a 100 kilometer radius in the dry hinterland, but which is very productive agriculturally, right? So what you see then is the coming alive of the lake ecosystem, uh, Udupanhalli, Jodh Krishnapura, one after one, another. And then there's an ecological regeneration because bird biodiversity now starts to increase, leopard spoots are found, foxes are coming back. So wastewater can be an ecological and agricultural resource. So the city is not a villain if it treats its wastewater and supplies it to its hinterland and invests enough. This is the quality of the water which is coming in into the lakes, as you see here. And then it recharges the aquifer. You're not allowed to draw the water directly from the lake. You're allowing it to recharge the aquifer and you pick it up from open wells and bore wells in the surrounding area. And you grow crops like uh, cucumber, tomato. And so therefore the food security is also ensured. A constant monitoring of the wastewater is called for to make sure that it uh, meets agricultural standards. And that, my dear friends, is what we need. We need lots of engagement, lots of stories, lots of learning, lots of science, and lots of water literacy. We need positive stories around water for our younger generation. One of the art exhibitions we organized when we asked children to paint water, there was not one positive thing they were seeing in the city. Now, this is not something that we can leave to generations, that they don't see anything positive at all with water. If we don't have many more positive stories, what will we work on to fulfill as part of our dreams? Right? Because the only thing we learn from history is that we do not learn from history, apparently. You know, hope that's agile for you. Yeah, so. And the one planet that we have is the blue planet and some vignettes around water and that's beautiful view of India. Yeah. Thanks a lot. So this is my sort of sharing with you around the narrative water and settlements and what we are all about. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Vishwanath. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, <clears throat> so, Dipta, am I being heard? Yes, you are. Yeah. Uh, so, Vishwanath. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, just uh, I thought we'd uh, open it up for people to ask you questions if they feel uh, uh, the need. But I imagine, uh, yeah, well, let's open it up. I, I um, just want to raise a couple of points, not questions really, but this whole aspect of urban areas and the um, the hard pavement, the runoffs, uh, the kind of uh, situations of flooding, particularly in urban areas where we we find our roads frequently flooded, uh, vehicles uh, underwater, uh, foundations weakening, and some of the houses kind of, particularly the weaker sections kind of coming down. And this is a recurring thing that happens, I think has happened over the last 50 years. And it seems that the uh, it's become something of a pay to company. Governments have uh, decided that this is how it's going to be, and um, the I think the the, uh, the issue around harvesting or at least holding this water for a while before it it runs off to the river, uh, and as it's been done in Bangalore with lakes and so on. But is this is this a, a situation that um, needs to be kind of looked at very urgently and is the lakes the only possible answer? Yeah, well, uh, so the, the, 
the building itself or the plot can contribute to become part of the solution by holding on to water in some tanks or in recharge wells and pushing it into the aquifer. So the solutions can start there. Of course, we'll have to look at the flood, flood plains and the lakes and the tanks and the low lying areas and protect them as part of our land use plan. So that the excess which moves out from the roads and from the other open spaces is held there and allowed to either be detained for some time or recharge the aquifer. But we'll also have to manage the aquifer. It won't be that we just keep on recharging the aquifer and not use the water because you may then have something called groundwater flooding. So it's an overall understanding of water. Added to this mess, uh, what's happening in urban areas is a lot of pipe water comes in and goes off as untreated wastewater. This untreated wastewater, unfortunately, does not go in sewage lines, but comes in our stormwater drains and therefore enters the whole lake uh, and river ecosystem. Right. So when the rains come, it layers itself on the sewage, which is already flowing there. And therefore, the fragility of the system becomes even more. Added to that is solid waste also entering in and choking up particular points uh, of the uh, water supply system. So we need a holistic, a holistic thinking where we engage the individual building to the city itself in planning for water. And with climate change, you know that the intensities of rainfall are increasing. In Bangalore, it used to be 60 millimeters per hour. It's now 125 millimeters per hour. So all these will have to be factored in if we have to manage water better in our cities. We also have the, the trees playing a role, the roots of the trees and the kind of network of trees um, in kind of making that, that soil perhaps porous and spongy and able to hold more. Um, Absolutely. Trees are crucial and especially old trees are very crucial because even the roots which die out are eaten by termites and become capillary zones for water to percolate in, right? So even a living tree is good enough in sense water, even a dead tree and a dead forest are very useful, right? Humus is useful, soil mulching is useful, organic carbon in soil is the best holder of water. Just by increasing organic carbon in soil, you can increase the soil moisture retentivity by four to six times. So we need a great soil rejuvenation program, a forest rejuvenation program, but we also need to live with the fact that we're altering the landscape with our built for, and that excess water has also to be managed by the building itself or by design itself. We need a combination of all of these. I wonder if we need a completely new way of designing foundations which can hold water uh, create these kind of capillaries in the ground um, because our traditional systems of construction, um, the there is always around preventing water from entering the foundations, you know, keeping the water away as far away as possible, creating plinth protection and creating that hardness around the structures as a way of keeping water away. Exactly, because the aquifer has been an enemy for us, right, for a long time. But now when we are dependent on it, we have to turn it to a friend and design wise, we still don't have enough tools and techniques to do that. What we found for Bangalore is just a small recharge well, which is just one meter in diameter and six meter deep can take in water at the rate of 10,000 liters an hour. And we say six meters to 10 meters deep because you go below the so uh, soil bearing, uh, load bearing capacity of the soil foundation, right? Which is typically one meter, 1.2 meters. You need to transfer it way below and make sure that vertically it goes below. So you have the structural integrity of the building protected, but you also act for recharge. We need those kind of solutions in many places. Sorry, um, uh, there are questions uh, from the audience. Uh, Riaz, would you please be kind enough to read them out? Yeah, Shivani had a question. Can I just, uh, you want me to answer that? So Shivani's question is, why did civilizations use groundwater instead of river water? Till the advent of the Industrial Revolution and the advent of pumps, steam engine based pumps, and in India it came in the 1860s and 1870s, we did not have the technology to pump water from a river to our cities and urban areas. Whereas a well brought the river water to your doorstep and you could lift the well water out with a pulley, right? with the hand, you don't need machines to do it. You can't do that with uh, river water. So therefore, uh, 
even in Mohenjo Daro, as was the ex classic example, it was the wells which provided water to that urban habitation and not uh, rivers, though the river was close by. Yeah. Vishwanath, maybe I can read out the questions to you. Sure. And uh, uh, there is uh, one from uh, Priya that asks, uh, you mentioned that before starting a large project, one must overlay it on an aquifer map and manage water. Uh, what would you recommend to, say, the Delhi Metro uh, dealing with land on a, on a large scale? So unfortunately, the Delhi Metro did not look at the aquifer. Now, if you want to look at large aquifer maps, it's available with the Central Groundwater Board. They have a, something called a district profile. Anybody can go on the web and get, download it, and you get broad aquifer mapping parameters. But because the Delhi Metro does not deal with water supply, and unfortunately, our water supply institutions like the Delhi Gel Board or the Bangalore Water Supply Sewerage Board don't look at groundwater as a source of water. They look at rivers and dams as sources of water. So groundwater is invisible to our institutions of governance. So there's nobody to protect it, right? So that's been the tragedy for our groundwater. And therefore, our building bylaws now have encouraged parking, double, triple basement parkings. These triple basement parkings usually pump out all the shallow aquifer if there's water in it and throw it out and then concrete it so that there's no water coming in. So they've permanently destroyed the aquifer, pumped out all the waters and dried up all the wells in the surrounding areas, and then we live with it. So the car is not an, an enemy when it is on the road, but even when it's parked, it's an enemy. Right? So this is the time where we have lack of governance, we lack uh, planning tools, and we lack design tools to ad uh, address groundwater sufficiently. We need to develop those. Uh, another question from Radhika. Uh, is there any cultivation that can be done using industrial wastewater? say like the farmer grew mulberry, uh, which was fed to silkworms. Yes, so uh, that's an interesting field that is uh, developed, uh, unlike domestic wastewater, which is broadly homogeneous across all cities of India and all towns of India, it's the same consistency. Industrial wastewater varies on the industry itself. So a tannery or a dyeing industry has a different wastewater as compared to other industries, right? So it depends on the quality of the wastewater, but there are now experiments going on to use wetlands to treat industrial wastewater also and make sure that it can be grown. And for example, energy plantations like uh, eucalyptus or acacia or bamboo can easily be grown with industrial wastewater without it entering into the food chain and therefore harming us. We'll have to look for solutions there. But some industrial wastewater is completely unusable because even plants and soil cannot handle it. Uh, one from Shreyas, which is uh, perhaps uh... Uh, an interesting one to take, uh, Vishwanath, which is uh, we have more than 120 step wells in Gujarat itself. Uh, do we see the life it, uh, life it carried in the past sometimes in the future again? Is it possible to revive, uh, 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 the, uh, 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 revive it again completely? So existing, uh, I mean, older water structures, are they possible to rejuvenate? Good question. You know, uh, there is now uh, the functional need of the step well is broadly gone in the urban milieu that we have created in the civilization and culture we have created. So it's functionally not necessary for most of society, right? So why should it be revived? Well, it could be revived due to nostalgia, to uh, uh, an idea of heritage being conserved. But what unfortunately happening is it's being culturally captured. You know, we are converting. Uh, step wells to religious places, which they were not really, right? So revival has a very loaded meaning. What do we want revived? In, in Chand Baudi, you now have a temple where a lot of uh, religious uh, offerings are thrown into the water and stuff like that. So I don't know. Uh, it's a very complex question. Sorry, you're on mute, yes. There's one on, uh, thank you for your thought-provoking talk. What are your views of extracting water from humidity in air? Yeah, so with my experience with technology, what proves to be a solution in the near term, uh, generally, I fear, becomes a problem in the long term, right? So nobody's thought of it at scale. 
when the ro plants came to india they are now in almost every village and uh, every town in karnataka at least people thought that was good clean water coming in now we found two problems with ro one the water is so clean that it's a problem for humans to consume two the rejects that are thrown out from this ro water what do we do with it we don't know we disperse it into the environment problems which we had never foreseen with ro similarly with desalination so with this humidity business um, i'd be wary but i'll tell you one thing it will start to work on the market and it will spread everywhere and we'll figure out what problems it causes professor vasavra professor chaya would you like to uh, join the conversation uh, unfortunately riyas i will have to leave for the while but uh, all right yeah. it was a fascinating lecture and its huge number of ideas that can affect our studio and i think it's is something which is a major contribution to the discussion around the studio thank you very much vishwana a uh, pleasure yes professor masavra please thank you vishwana probably yes, good to hear you Uh, you know, during the documentation of the old city, uh, we documented 128 wells in the historic city, and most of them had water. But during the British period, you know, they sort of spread a scare of diseases, and they sealed it. so each of these wells are sort of sealed from top and we got some of them opened and we also got the water tested surprisingly in spite of this kind of you know sort of sealing for such a long period the water was found to be fresh so now how to get the the authorities to come around and believe that this kind of water could be a good boon you know for the city areas where water is many times supplied only for a for an hour right. during the day so this is a big problem you see because during the british and in many areas you know i have found that there were notice boards displayed on the step wells even if they had water that this water should not be used wow. so you know this and then this idea of really you know putting um, chlorine and this kind of stuff in this well water is the way they feel that they can somehow ensure the purity of the water right. so is there a way by which one can really I mean, have you tried this in your work to somehow enlighten these people to come back and think about this? You see, when you say that aquifer water is always filtered, you know, because it comes to the soil. So, yeah. how to somehow bring this kind of consciousness in the authorities? You see, because ultimately, whatever we do is something you know which is imposed by the authorities, or we are right. supposed to do. is imposed by the authorities so have uh, you have you gone into any such kind of you know uh, efforts you know where for example for the old city of andabad this is a huge resource you see yeah and the only thing they agreed was funny enough that you know these wells could be somehow used for any kind of fire you know to draw water <laughs> and that was also very funny because they said that since the the fire tankers cannot enter the old city lanes you know this kind of wells could be a kind of standby you know capacity to fight fires if it happens in the old city <laughs> true so professor there is a, a lot of complex problems around this what has happened is i i i hate to fetishize the well i don't want to fetishize it and say okay this is the only solution but the clear examples have come from belgaum which i showed to you where the city engineers themselves realized the potential of the wells 
and with the community they took a promise that you will not throw ganesha idols into it you will not throw garbage into it protect it so that the waters we will clean and supply to the locality so they localize the distribution to that particular locality and the community took the onus of preserving and protecting it and then recharge followed with the community and the city itself together now there was great difficulty when this uh, municipality did the work it was done by an engineer uh, it was not recognized in the sectors at all because everybody was obsessed with 24 bar 7 water supply or or uh, privatization yes. of water supply whereas here uh, the well provides you 24 bar 7 water supply and it's actually privatized because the house owner is taking care of it right so we, we cannot imagine 24 bar 7 as coming other than a pipe or a pump or something of that sort exactly. so when they, it, it came to the national water awards i was sitting in the jury and i sort of arm twisted the other jurors to say ki isko kam se kam recognize karo so we'll have to build the narrative around the solutions and as you rightly pointed out get the authorities and institutions more interested in it the the sad fact is that we don't have groundwater institutions especially in our urban areas and till we get the governance right with an institution which understands and manages it better uh, we are speaking to the blind because they don't see groundwater so it's a slightly long battle and it will go on for there just another anecdote because you raised this very question as to why the british seal wells when canal irrigation came to india it came as a financial enterprise it did not come as a water enterprise it came as a financial enterprise and the british wanted to make money it was the east india company which brought it so when they brought the canal water, the upper Yamuna canal and the upper Kendra canal water to United province or UP as it is now, farmers said, we don't want the water. Our wells are good enough. Ye pani kafi hai. We don't want the well. The collectors forcibly closed the wells and demanded that the farmers get canal water. The argument of the farmers was, we want the water that we are in control of. From the well, I can lift it whenever I want to. But the canal water, I depend on somebody to open the gate and some authority to do it, and then my dependency is increased completely on it. That's what the results showed, that the canal brought malaria with it, it brought control into a centralized command structure, and it caused great economic and ecological hardship for quite some time. And then the well sort of diminished in return. So when we return back to the old, we'll have to deal with the fact that we have new water. And in our cities, we have piped water now, so that's a convenience. People don't want to go back to the well easily. How do we deal with it is a complex choice. That is true. Yes, do we run through the other questions quickly? How much time? I don't know, uh, Vishnath, you have. Uh, we, got... we, can, we can go for maybe 10 minutes more. Uh, that's if that's okay. okay with Vishwanath. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm fine. Yes, you want to uh, choose the yeah, question? I'm just, I'm just going through and screening. Um, So Priya Sham had this question about self-sufficiency being the new fashionable, right? Yes. And, and that's nice because the, uh, the fashionable drives some ideas and interests and it's good uh, as things go along. But uh, just for Priya Sham's uh, sake and for the others, there's a particular thing which Lee Kuan Yew as the president of Singapore when he started the initiative to make Singapore independent of water supply from Malaysia, told his engineers. And so they went into something called the four taps approach. They had, had rainwater harvesting. They had the wastewater recycling called new, uh, new water. They had water from the sea, desalinated water, and they get water from Malaysia, which they bring in four taps approach. So Lee Kuan Yew said, look, we will never be independent of Malaysia for our water supply. And the reason for it is this, that when I want to deal with my neighbors, I want to deal with it with a sense of humility, not arrogance independence or me being self-sufficient may, may bring me the arrogance to deal with you differently. But if I'm dependent on you for water, my relationship with you will be different. Now, this is a profoundly difficult statement to make for a political leadership. But even we, we as gated communities and the cities withdraw from all the functions of the city within our gated community and we couldn't care less. Now, if we become water independent and wastewater independent, we couldn't care less as to what the city is dealing with in terms of water and wastewater. So there is a there is some form of dependency, which is self-dependency, which is lifeline based, which you should be, but you should never become independent of the community is my, yeah, my thinking for uh, you guys, if you agree with it or not. 
we are after all part of a community the water of course comes from a large catchment it comes from a large aquifer you if you think that you are alone and no man is an island right but i could go on on that somebody is suggesting whether uh, uh, treated sewage water can be sprinkled in the environment to reduce the uh, spm within the city uh, it's being done in delhi and it's being done in some cities it's done in many cities in china uh, it, yeah it That's can be done better use for that water the fact is that it's really nutrient rich water and it's excellent for agricultural productivity and so therefore in the wastewater policy we have a challenge we have to push it through that agricultural reuse should have first priority then there should be ecological priority that lakes and wetlands revival and third priority should be for industries and urban reuse very often the imagination of treated wastewater is as urban or industrial reuse immediately right because it's commercially viable but these other livelihood based or ecology biodiversity based reuses should also have some charge on this mishana there's a question that is is there a scope uh, is there space and scope for small scale hydroelectric plants for example enough uh, uh, for a 36 acre community in a system with uses all the methods that you have mentioned uh, okay. so i think the question is really about uh, yeah sorry go yeah yeah no so yes the thing is that if you have flowing water and falling water then uh, you can of course generate a hydroelectric plant but where is the flowing water where is the falling water uh, that's a big challenge so therefore solar seems to be the most appropriate alternative uh, uh, energy for the moment right Vishwanath, uh, if I may ask you a question, uh, you know there is the riverine system that you talked about in, in in a lot of detail, and and then the groundwater system uh, that is there. But we also have a seven thousand five hundred odd kilometer coastline. Yeah. Uh, what is the uh, the role of uh, sea and oceanic apart from the monsoon part of it in terms of water? Do we have any kind of uh, relationship to that? Uh, Yeah, I just leave yeah. that as a broad. Yeah, yeah, question. no. So there's a very interesting line of thought which is being pursued, which says that it's the fresh water which goes in during the floods into the Bay of Bengal, for example, or some parts of the Arabian Sea. That fresh water lends in the bay actually helps the monsoon because fresh water can evaporate much easier than salt water, right? And this engineering notion that all water entering the sea is a waste, you know, this is critically altering the monsoon cycles, is altering the littoral zone where uh, uh, the biodiversity of fish is the highest because of the sediments that used to come in and the nutrients that would come in and it's altering coastlines too because of the wave action right so these are complex interactions and one would be very circumspect in not allowing fresh water to reach the sea which is a complex it's a comprehensive notion amongst engineers no you talk at any institution level in the government of india or even political leadership or even large scale leadership water entering the sea is a waste this is catastrophic for us in the long term and how do we reverse that reverse would be a big challenge for us uh, this also this whole idea that uh, i mean i think gener i mean is a development from that is this whole uh, river interlinking uh, idea uh, <laughs> yeah, your views on that one so this uh, there's no end to human greed no so all the waters that you transfer into a basin if you grow sugar cane there there won't be enough water in india to feed all the sugar cane in india because we have that arable land but if you just switch the cropping pattern to more appropriate ones just the four major crops if we switch to more appropriate ones you know if we switch rice wheat sugar cane and cotton and get it right you don't need water from any other basin right and the ecological consequences of that is is uh, frightening to say the least So it is a matter. It's sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. Please finish. I am asking. So, so it is. It is actually a question of what we are doing with the water, what we are growing, and how we are using it, rather than uh, uh, rather than the water itself or the Absolutely. the flows of water itself. 
truly. So we must ask, what is the demand for? So in any water balance that we draw in design, we must ask, is the water being used wisely? The second question to ask is, is the water being used efficiently? Once these two questions are answered, then you look for supply, right? And usually biomes and ecosystems have come to a stasis with what can be grown and what can be managed within that system. The moment you bring in external inputs, then the system will grow faster. But once the external input decreases or collapses, then the whole system here will collapse. Classic example is a well in Rajasthan where we had a pleasure of going and seeing near uh, Ramgarh, where the shepherds were using camels to draw water from the well. So my stupid question at that particular point of time is, Ke, diesel engine kyun laga lete? why don't you put a diesel engine, right? So they said, okay, <laughs> diesel engine to laga lenge. Pani jada a jayega. The sheep and cows and camel will increase. The grazing land remains the same. These will overgraze, the grazing land will collapse, and then what will we have to give water to us? So the balance, the fraught balance between all three was by the animal lifting of the well water. Now there was a profound philosophy in that. And in our efficiency and engineering mindset, we don't see it. And we don't see that with landscapes too, right? So there is a limit to what landscapes can be doing, ecologically speaking, and that limit should be recognized and dealt with. Rajiv Kishan pointed out, no, I mean, in a desert, you start to grow trees or you start to the Indra Gandhi Canal, Rajasthan Canal and bring water to the desert. And I mean, this kind of madness has no end for it. So in some sense, what that, I mean, if I extrapolate that, uh, Vishwanath, what I'm, uh, what I'm imagining is rather than GDP, we need a balance uh, that is able to look at production limits uh, rather than uh, growth. Uh, is yeah. that how you see it? Is that uh, where this leads uh, in, uh, in informing our imagination and uh, determining how we, uh, how we look at production? Because I mean, that's what's... Uh, causing the trouble in some ways. Absolutely. So it's, uh, so it's rampant capitalism and rampant consumerism and an economic model which is uh, some simply depleting natural resources and ex exceeding pollutions. Planetary boundaries are being exceeded August 22nd. Day before yesterday was planetary boundary day. We exceeded the planetary limits on that day for this year, right? So the root cause is economics of it. And then we'll have to find answers in degrowth and other forms of economics only. Good to look at Schumacher, look, good to look at uh, Gandhian economics too now. You uh, reminded us of this uh, incredible imagination of having a canal system instead of a rail system. Yeah. Uh, which is, I, I mean, to, to imagine a country with a canal system instead of a rail, rail system is incredible, of course, in terms of water transportation and so on. But don't, do you think that it would have actually uh, allowed for the evaporation to happen much later? Uh, as against a ground, kind of a subsurface groundwater riverine system? Uh, yeah, so it's in the uh, era of the imagination as to what it would have been and how it would have worked. Uh, but the railways, for example, the network of the railways, which we have created in India, which is the largest rail network in the world, right? That was also something that people had not imagined at all. The railways, proved to be extractive of our forests, especially, and of our mineral resources. The canal system would not have been that extractive. Uh, it would have covered areas of transportation which would not, could not be linked to high mountains and high uh, places of forest growth, right? So there are two ways of looking at it. Um, I don't know. I really haven't modeled it to figure out what it would have looked like. That was an incredible talk. I think it covered so much of ground. Um, we had water, soil, relationships between people. Um, I think it much to think about. Um, are there any other questions uh, from the panelists or from the attendees? We had, of course, some other questions coming in. Um, quickly, there is, I'll just read out in a sense that is there an alternative, alternative method to protecting rivers from industrial waste such as um, rather than, you know, dumping them. Uh, example, like in tanneries. And then there was another question in urban areas, what can individual households do in order to be more sensitive towards water or what basic awareness should be followed? What do you think of rice cultivation in Punjab? The amount of irrigation and water required for it since Punjab has essentially a dry climate. It is also altering the groundwater conditions and increasing humidity locally. Yeah. 
So I'll go backwards. Uh, we are not growing crops in the right regions meant for it. So Punjab is trying its damnedest to reverse this uh, overconsumption of aquifers and try to persuade farmers to shift away from rice to other crops. It's going to be a long haul, but it has to be done. Otherwise, we'll be left with no aquifers in the Punjab over the next 15, 20 years. In terms of industrial effluents, what we have done is we have not created the right institutions which have been able to do the job. Our single, single biggest uh, institutional failure has been with the state pollution control boards. In Karnataka, for example, they have not won a single case in the court since they were set up in 73. Can you believe it? They have not been able to shut an industry since 73, which is a polluting industry. So unless we get our regulatory act together and uh, get our control of industries better, we are going to suffer from the fact that industry will continue to pollute. What can you do at a household level? Well, I've got a half an hour talk on that, but you, what you can do is you can uh, harvest rainwater, recycle gray water, have something called an eco-sanitation system. You can also grow rice on your rooftop. In a 40 square meter uh, roof area, you can be energy sufficient, water sufficient, food sufficient, waste sufficient, and biodiversity sufficient. But that's a talk for another day. A lot can be done at a household level. So, Vasavara has uh, a question. You're on mute, sir. I don't have a question, but I have a suggestion to you for the studio. I think you're examining this entire central vista. And one point uh, Vishwanath took out was very important. Before any kind of urban development, which is proposed in a particular piece of land, if the architects could also be sensitized about the quantity of aquifer available, you know, for that particular kind of development, it would be a good idea to somehow make the students conscious about this, you know, and uh, at least think of this, you see, and also as far as your areas are concerned, which you're covering, it would be a good idea to somehow address to this, you know, in, as, as part of the studio exercise, you see, maybe a small exercise with the help of maybe uh, Vishwanath to find out the amount of aquifer, you know, that is available in that area. Because so much of green, so much of development is really proposed now under the new scheme. And if one can really develop a small critique on this, you see, it would be a worth exercise, you see, which can be a follow-up of this lecture. So this was just a kind of suggestion as a follow-up. And also to keep uh, Vishwanath engaged a little more on this, you know. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Vasarada. Thank you, Vishwanath. That was an absolutely uh, wonderful, wonderful talk. As uh, as expected, and uh, I hope you will allow us to catch you from time to time uh, and uh, get more inputs uh, when uh, uh, around all of these kind of uh, themes of water, community, environment, etc. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I'm watching all of your YouTube channels, all the lectures by everybody, and I'm actually learning quite a lot from all of them. So I'm, it's my pleasure to be contributing to the extent that I could, but I'm also very happy that I'm learning a lot from all others. Thank you for that opportunity too, right? Thank you, Vishwanath. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Sudipto. Thank you.